Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Brian Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. Keep your seats, please, and kindly refrain from rustling your popcorn bags while I say a few words about a comedy which has recently been produced by the 20th Century Fox Studios. It is titled Sitting Pretty. My submerged vanity will not allow me to say that Sitting Pretty is a good picture. It is not a good picture. It is a great picture. The critics insist that my presence in the cast as a baby-hating babysitter elevates this cinema epic from mediocrity to sublimity. Here you see Robert Young, who plays the role of a harassed father. And this is a close-up of Maureen O'Hara, whose beauty enhances every picture in which she appears. I regret to inform you that in Sitting Pretty, I do not get Miss O'Hara. And now the screen is graced with a close-up of me. No amount of genius will make me a Casanova or (laughs) a Tyrone Power. But as Belvedere, the babysitter, I do have my triumphs, especially over these three potential assassins and their parents. Mr. King. I've been trying to teach Roddy that bathing is not a social function. Kindly do not talk to him. Mr. Belvedere, you dance divinely. Yes, I do. What's the matter? You forget something? I can't go. Why? Well, I can't leave you here alone with Belvedere. (laughs) Why not? Belvedere! Now eat your breakfast. And chew each mouthful 28 times. Not 20, mind you, or 26, but 28 times. What's the matter? What happened? Why, Roddy! I guarantee that he will never throw cereal at me or anyone else again, ever. Take my word for it. Sitting pretty is solid entertainment beamed right at your risibilities. It was made strictly for laughs with laughs. It was my good fortune to be cast in it. It will be your good fortune to see and enjoy it. Yours very truly, Clifton Webb. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie Sitting Pretty from 1948. The studio was 20th Century Fox, and the release date was March 10th, 1948. The running time was 83 minutes, and it was in black and white. I don't have the budget totals, and I don't really have the box office totals, but according to a Variety Magazine article on January 5th, 1949, the film was the 13th most grossing film of 1948, so it looks like it was pretty popular. Leonard Maltin, in his excellent classic movie guide, gives it 3.5 out of 4 stars, and his quick little synopsis is, Clifton Webb is perfect as a self-centered genius who accepts a job as a full-time babysitter in a gossip-laden suburban town. Highly entertaining, followed by the Mr. Belvedere comedy sequels. So like a lot of classic movies from the 1930s and 40s, I first saw Sitting Pretty at the wonderful Stanford Theater in Palo Alto, California. The movie is quick, but it's packed with some very witty dialogue and a really enjoyable plot. And the success of Sitting Pretty, again, spawned two sequels around the Clifton Webb character named Lynn Belvedere. And actually, that was later the inspiration for the 1980s TV series Mr. Belvedere, of course, with the baseball announcing great Bob Euchre, on the show. Sitting Pretty was actually based on the 1947 novel Belvedere by Gwen Davenport. All right, let's get into the main cast. You get Robert Young, who plays Harry King. Young would eventually be best known by playing the lead character in the 1950s series Father Knows Best, and then later as Marcus Welby, M.D., in the 1970s. But prior to Sitting Pretty, he acted in a ton of films, though most of them were considered B-movies, since these were the days where studios essentially owned the actors, and even the superstars of the days were forced to appear in whatever film the studio told them to. Young pretty much took every role that he was assigned to because he lived in fear of being fired by MGM. 
Once his contract was up with MGM in the early 1940s, he then started to appear in more prominent roles like Sitting Pretty. Maureen O'Hara plays Tacey King, and O'Hara was born in Ireland before moving to Hollywood when she was 19 in the late 1930s in order to further her acting career. O'Hara was best known for playing really strong female roles and had a no-nonsense attitude, along with her beauty and, of course, her red hair. Fans of Disney films will likely remember her because she was in the original Parent Trap and played the mom of Haley Mills. And prior to Sitting Pretty, some of her more memorable roles for her included Jamaica Inn, which was an Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, How Green Was My Valley, and the original Miracle on 34th Street, where she played Natalie Wood's mom. Clifton Webb plays Lynn Belvedere and started his movie career very later in life at the age of 55, though he had been a really prominent theater actor on Broadway since he was 19. Webb's first major film role was a terrific one playing Waldo Lidecker in the excellent film noir called Laura from 1944. He appeared in two more good films prior to Sitting Pretty, both in 1946, The Dark Corner and The Razor's Edge. And many movie fans also will remember him for playing the father in the original Cheaper by the Dozen with Myrna Loy. It was later remade with Steve Martin. The director was Walter Lang, and Lang started directing silent films in the mid-1920s. His most regarded film that he directed was The King and I from 1956. Alright, let's get right into the movie. So, it starts with the following place card. Hummingbird Hill is a typical suburban community where everyone knows a little more than a little about everybody. The neighborhood kind of looks like the set of Leave it to Beaver, as is common in small towns and close-knit neighborhoods, you always have the busybodies who want to know a little bit about everything going on in the town at all times. In this case, you have Clarence, played by Richard Hayden, who has a super annoying voice, but this works perfectly for the character, and he, of course, lives with his mother, played by Grace Hampton. Hey! Come here a minute, will you? Were you addressing me? Yeah. Did this Hummingbird Hill up here? That is the name of this community, mm, yes. I'm trying to find 21 Carver's Lane. They phoned for a cab. Oh, someone going away? Well, how would I know? They want a cab, that's all. You know where it is? I do. You continue on and turn left into the first street, and this is the fourth house on the right. Thanks, buddy. You are entirely welcome. Hey, you mind telling me what you're doing with that feather? I am cross-pollinating a specimen of the family Eretasia. Come again? I am trying to develop a new strain of iris. I breed them. No kidding. You mean like some guys breed cocker spaniels? The principle, believe it or not, is identical. Clarence! Uh, yes, Mother? What did that taxi man want? He's looking for 21 Carver's Lane, Mother. What on earth do the Harry Kings need a cab for? I don't know, Mother. Well, why didn't you ask him? I did, but he doesn't know either, Mother. Oh, you never find out anything. Better drink it now before it gets cold. Never mind the milk. Wheel me over to that other window. Quickly. Careful now. Hurry, hurry. We are then introduced to the King family. Maureen O'Hara is Tacey King. I always thought it was Stacy, but it's actually Tay C. So there you go. She's the wife and a stay-at-home mom of three young boys. And yet another live-in nanny has decided to quit due to the boys being a handful. And by the way, their dog is like another kid and is the size of Marmaduke. Robert Young plays a lawyer, Harry King, who is the husband and father. Ronnie, will you please stop crying? You sent for a cab, lady. I'm afraid you come to the wrong house. I didn't fall for it. <laughs> Ronnie, will you please stop? Well, this is number 21. Somebody from here phoned for a cab. I'm sorry, but there must be some mistake. There's no mistake, Mrs. King. I phoned for a cab. Really, Mrs. Maypole, I, I don't quite understand. There's nothing to understand. I'm quitting, that's all, and right now. But, but you can't. You, you just can't walk out without... That's what you think. What, I should put him in the cab? Yes, you can get by them kids and that awful dog without getting them smashed. Now, Mrs. Maypole, I don't know what's upset you. Oh, you I... don't, huh? Well, I'll tell you. It's them three kids of yours that's upset me and that horrible dog. Upset me? They've driven me nuts. I'll never take another job again anywhere where they have kids or pets, so help me. 
We had three children and a dog, Mrs. Maple, when you came. We didn't spring them on you unexpectedly. I know. I should have my head examined. Good day, Mrs. King. Mail me them two days I got coming. Don't worry, Mom. She was a pain in the neck. She couldn't cook good either. You're a much better cook, Mom. Hello. Oh, good morning, Mrs. King. Just a moment, please. Yeah? Your wife, Mr. King, on two. All right. Hello, honey. Say, Mr. Hammond wants us to... What? She didn't. Why, the old bag. The maid quit. Uh, it's just Bill. It's all right. You can talk. What? I said, in a way, I'm glad to get rid of her. All she did was guzzle beer all day. What? Tonight? But how can we? Who'll stay with the children? Well, you'll just have to get a babysitter. I've told you, Mr. Hammond wants you and me and Bill and Edna to come for dinner tonight. I don't know. Yeah. Tell her Edna raise a steak, too. But she's going to find a sitter or else. But it... Uh, honey, I can't argue with you. Now I'm due in court. I'll see you later. And start phoning sitters. Well, okay, I'll try. Bye. The local network of babysitters have heard about the King family making it almost impossible for them to hire a sitter, even just for one night. Mr. King on the phone. I guess he wants you to sit with his kids. Not me. Not while I'm conscious. Not those kids. Tell him I dropped dead. Hello? Yes, I heard Mrs. Phillips. She just dropped dead. Fresh out of names, dear, or fresh out of charm? Well, we can always try Ginger. Oh, no, you don't. Why? What's wrong with Ginger? Well, in the first place, she's a nitwit, and in the second place, she's got a silly, idiotic crush on you. So they do finally get a sitter, but it's Ginger, played by Betty Lynn, who has sort of a teen crush on Harry, which amuses Tacy. However, it's the best they can do on short notice. Unfortunately, Ginger decides to throw a sock hop in the living room of their house, and the Kings find out from their nosy neighbor Clarence, who informs them when he just magically shows up at the party they're attending. This actually reminds me of a story when I was a kid when my parents went out and we, they hired uh, a babysitter from down the street and they ended up, or the, the girl at the time, threw a huge party in the house. I think I was probably like four or five at the time and yeah, there was like cigarettes all over the place and everything and, and uh, yep, I ratted her out. I didn't care at that point. Shouldn't be throwing a party. We didn't think you'd be back so soon. So it appears. Hi, Pop. We even want you to dance. You kids run upstairs to bed. Go ahead. Hurry up. The idea of letting the baby out of bed at this hour. Are you out of your mind? Gosh, Mrs. King, I hope you're not sore just because I invited a few friends. Golly, a person go absolutely mad with nothing to do but sit. If I were your mother, which heaven forbid, I'd make it extremely painful for you to sit for the next few days. Look, Ginger, I think you'd better have your friends... Gosh, Mr. King, I feel so sorry for you. She has a terrible disposition, hasn't she? So Tacy decides to place an ad for a nanny in the paper, and they do get a response. Harry, come here quick. I've got an answer. Answer to what? My ad. Huh? Darling, I didn't want to tell you, but after that Ginger episode, I put an ad in the Saturday Review, and I've got a wonderful answer. Ad for what? A babysitter, darling, a resident babysitter. Oh, you're crazy. I knew you'd say that. That's why I didn't tell you. Listen to what I put in. Somewhere there must be a struggling young person who would welcome a delightful room, private bath, full board, in exchange for sitting with three adorable children evenings and some light housework. Congenial, cultured atmosphere. Write fully, box 2301. Aren't you stretching things a bit, calling our three adorable? Well, anyway, it seems to have snared her. This is her answer. 
Dear sir or madam, if not too late, I wish to apply for the position you advertised. I am engaged in a form of work which makes me indifferent to my surroundings, providing I have a place in which I can find solitude. I have studied psychology and am perfectly competent to handle children of all ages with efficiency and dispatch. Yours sincerely, Lynn Belvedere. Don't you think she sounds marvelous? Well, she writes a short business-like letter, yes, but what do we know about it? Well, anyway, I'm going to follow this up. Okay, go ahead. What can you lose? So, Lynn Belvedere arrives to start the nanny position. Of course, Tacey just assumes it's a female. Well, much to their surprise, it's a middle-aged man. Yes? Uh, Mrs. King? Uh, Mrs. Harry King? Yes. Uh, good evening. I am Lynn Belvedere. You're... Who? Lynn Belvedere. But... But you can't be. Why not? Have you ever seen me before? No. No, of course I haven't. Very well, then. How do you do? Uh, Edna, this man claims that he's Lynn Belvedere. <laughs> no. <laughs> Edna, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is my friend, Mrs. Philby. Oh, she doesn't live here. Delighted. Uh, this is quite a shock, you see. Well, we weren't expecting him. <laughs> well, I naturally thought you were a woman. <laughs> you know. Your advertisement, of which I have a copy here, made no mention of sex. Possibly not, but it was obviously implied. I advertise for someone to help with the housework and sit with my children. Mrs. King, I happen to dislike all children intensely but I assure you that I can readily attend to their necessary, though unpleasant, wants. <sighs> Sorry, I've just had a long and very trying journey in a day coach. May I see my room? Well, I... Uh, now, look here, Mr. Belvedere, you're obviously here under false pretenses. To the contrary. If some young female arrived, calling herself Lynn Belvedere, she would be here under false pretenses. May I please see my room? But, but my husband isn't home and yet, that, and I don't if quite... I may say so, is a matter of complete indifference to me. I take it that you are not retaining my services to sit with him. Now, may I see my room? Why, well, I guess so. Oh, it's upstairs. Good evening. What are you doing up now? Now go back to sleep. Is he a babysitter? Gee whiz. Uh, never mind now. Uh, go to bed. Oh, uh, uh, these are my sons, uh, Larry and, and Tony, and the uh, baby's asleep. Mom, why is it a man? Uh, you see, Mr. Belvedere, they also thought that you were going to be, uh, well, anyway, they seem to be quite fascinated by you. The fascination, I assure you, is not mutual. Which way, please? Go to bed. She whiz. We uh, tried to fix it up as nicely as we could. I, I hope you like it. After the obvious eliminations have been made, I believe it will be entirely satisfactory. For my work, I require an atmosphere of Spartan simplicity. And may I ask what your profession is? Certainly. I am a genius. Clifton Webb is absolutely perfect in this role. And, and so while the entire cast is, is a delight, Webb is absolutely the star, and every scene he appears in is just terrific. Harry can't believe they hired a male nanny, but it leads to another amusing scene. Hello, dear. You back? Back. You and your cockeyed classified ad, she never even showed up. I hung her on the station till the porter practically threw me out. Darling, I've got something to tell you. Uh, <laughs> while you were gone... What's so funny? <laughs> Go on, tell them. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm afraid to even kill me. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Mrs. King. Before I retire for the night, may I inquire what time you serve breakfast? Um, uh, about 7.30, usually. Uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps I should tell you I'm a vegetarian. I like fruit juice, coffee, and thinly sliced gluten bread 
toasted. I'll uh, try to remember. Thank you. Good night. Who in the heck was that? That, darling, is Lynn Belvedere. Huh? <laughs> I love that Lynn Belvedere asked for gluten bread. <laughs> None of this trendy bullshit with non-gluten. Remember, he's a genius. He knows what he's talking about. So Harry and Tacey decide to fire Mr. Belvedere before he even starts a job officially the next morning at breakfast. He doesn't come down, so they enter his room to find him standing on his head, practicing yoga. Again, they try to fire him at breakfast, but that doesn't go as planned. Don't do that, little boy. Leave Mr. Belvedere alone, darling. Uh, you should be flattered. Uh, he hates strangers as a rule. Now look here, Mr. Belvedere, a joke is a joke, but uh, this can't go on. And why not, Mr. King? I am perfectly willing to carry out my end of our agreement. I see no reason why you should default on yours. But it's obviously impossible. You couldn't do the things we require. For instance, could you uh, bathe Roddy? For many years, I have successfully bathed individuals of all ages and sexes, and I've never had any complaints. Hey, baby. Don't do that again. That's enough, Roddy, now. Stop it, stop it. My wife tells me that uh, you're a genius. That is correct. Well, if I'm not too inquisitive, do you mind telling me what form it takes? I am, in my way, a philosopher. Oh, I see. You just sit and think. Mr. King. If more people just sat and thought, the world might not be in the stinking mess that it is. Well, maybe you've got something there. But, uh, Mr. Belvedere, can you really handle children? Hey, May. Uh, Mrs. King, as I told you last night, I dislike children intensely, and yours, if I may say so, have peculiarly repulsive habits and manners. However, I assure you that I can cope with them successfully, uh, with a free hand. Gesundheit. Now, <coughs> well, I'd better get out of the office. Go on, kids. I'll see you tonight. Bye, Pop. Bye. Walk out the car, anyway. Oh, excuse me. Say good night. You will remain seated. Now eat your breakfast. And chew each mouthful 28 times. Not 20, mind you, or 26, but 28 times. <laughs> Well, I don't know. What do you think? Should we give the guy a whirl for a day or two? We can try. At least the children seem to like him. <laughs> What's the matter? What happened? Why, Roddy? Mrs. King, throughout this grisly meal, your son has been pelting me with cereal. I have taught him an object lesson, and as you will observe, he doesn't like it. I guarantee that he will never throw cereal at me or anyone else again, ever. <laughs> Mr. Belvedere, consider yourself hired. He's done that to me, too. You've got something. I couldn't agree with you more, Mr. King. You might even say I have everything. So you really couldn't see it because it's a visual gag, but Mr. Belvedere dumped the entire bowl of oatmeal on the infant's head. <laughs> Today, Child Protective Services would be called since we're now in a society of letting kids do whatever they want. So Mr. Belvedere actually teaches the older kids yoga, and Tacy ends up adoring him, all in one day. He fixed the icebox, trained the dog, and even gave the baby a bath. And he's also a terrific cook. Essentially, he's the male version of Mary Poppins. However, even with all the positives, Tacy is still curious about what he does in his room that deserves total silence. Now, I won't spoil this plot point for you, but it is a great payoff at the end of the film. The Kings try all sorts of tricks to try to discover what he's doing in his room, but to no avail. However, shrouded in mystery, Mr. Belvedere continues to be a hit for the family, and is still with them come the winter months. This leads to an amusing exchange with the town's busybody, Clarence. Uh, good morning, Belvedere. You will kindly address me as Mr. Belvedere. 
until I grant you permission to drop the title. A contingency which seems hardly likely, Mr. Appleton. Oh, well, really, I... I intended no offence. Uh, tell me, uh, Mr. Belvedere, are you completely happy with the Harry Kings? Only an idiot is completely happy anywhere. <laughs> I understand those dear little boys are devoted to you, and that Mrs. King considers you <laughs> quite a treasure. Indeed. Yes, indeed, and she should. As my mother is always saying, good servants are worth their weight in gold. The next time your parent makes that original observation, tell her it's one of the older clichés. Yes, I will. Incidentally, my mother is very anxious to make your acquaintance properly. Perhaps you could drop in for a visit on your next afternoon off. I am not a servant, Mr. Appleton. My afternoons are always my own. <laughs> well, in that case, drop in any time for a glass of sherry. I dislike sherry as much as I deplore the habit of dropping in on people uninvited. <laughs> but, Mr. Belvedere, I am inviting you. And I, sir, am declining. Good day. <laughs> It's really fascinating to watch parenting in the 1940s. For example, Mr. Belvedere leaves the baby in the bath alone and then instructs him to wash and not to treat bath time as a social event. And it works! However, today, I don't think anyone would leave a kid in the bath alone. Survival of the fittest is no longer a mantra for today's society. There's an amusing scene where one of the boys has a bad stomach ache in the middle of the night. They have to wake up Mr. Belvedere because he's taking care of the children alone because Tacy is actually staying the night at her friend's house since Harry's on a business trip. So even though parenting was more strict than today, the morals of having a single man sleep in the same house as a married woman whose husband was out of town has a whole different set of rules. This is really fascinating in a way. In any case, the stomach ache was due to the boy swallowing chewing gum earlier in the day. Because Tacy came home to attend to the kids, the busybody Clarence shows up to find out what was going on. Of course, this leads to all sorts of gossip that Belvedere was alone with Tacy. So scandalous. All because Clarence is like a little old lady. The rumor even gets back to Harry's boss. And because it's a game of telephone, the gossip spreads that the two of them were drunk together. <laughs> This, of course, leads to a kind of Three's Company type mix-up, and Harry thinks it's best that they get rid of Mr. Belvedere to stop the gossip. Would you mind telling me just what you were doing? I was permitting your wife to massage my larynx. And I might add, Mr. King, that your greeting to your wife is scarcely cordial, to say the least. You keep out of this. I'll greet my wife any way I like. Harry, what's the matter with you? Oh, it's a fine thing. I'm not back ten minutes before Hammond reads me the riot act about all this gossip. Gossip? Tell what gossip? What are you talking about? Gossip about you and Belvedere, that's what I'm talking about. And I don't mind telling you, it's jeopardizing my position. Oh, stop ranting. You're not in court. Now look here, Tacey. And stop raising your voice. I'll raise the roof if I want to. Very well. Oh, Tacey, I... I'm willing to believe that all these rumors about a drunken orgy in your night clothes with Belvedere are somewhat garbled, but... So that's I... it. Mr. Appleton's fine hand. But my gosh, when I came in the house just now, you were practically holding him in your arms. For heaven's sake, you saw what I was doing. She was merely feeling my bone structure. You shut up and listen. I've been listening. All I can hear is a typical suburban husband reacting in a typically stupid and stuffy manner to a typical tempest in a teapot. He's right. And as for that drunken orgy you were talking about, Tony got us all up in the middle of the night with a stomach ache. I dashed over from Edna's and I wasn't in the house a half an hour when that horrible little Mr. Appleton came snooping around. Oh. Well, I imagine it was something like that. Look, I'll admit it is all pretty silly. Very silly. But... Go on. Well, I was just thinking that perhaps it might be simpler for everybody all around if, if uh, Mr. Belvedere sought employment elsewhere. In other words, to satisfy malicious gossips like Mr. Hammond, Mr. Appleton, and his awful mother, you want to kick Mr. Belvedere out? In a word, yes. And that is your final decision, Mr. King? Yes. I'm sorry, but that's final. No, Daddy! No! Please let him stay! Please, Daddy! Don't go, Mr. Belvedere, please! Shh, quiet, quiet. Your father's not the type to be swayed by sentimental pleading. Don't let him go, Daddy, please! We love Mr. Belvedere! Don't go, Uncle Len! Don't ever again, as long as you live, dare to call me Uncle. By no stretch of the imagination could I possibly be a relative of yours. My name is Mr. Belvedere. Is that clear? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Of course, the gossip continues after Tacy and her friend run into Mr. Belvedere at a seminar, and Clarence and his mother sees Tacy and Belvedere dancing. Clifton Webb was actually a terrific dancer from his early days acting on Broadway. So the rest of the movie is a typical trope where Harry and Tacy argue about Belvedere, and she goes to her parents. While this plot point was typical of, of family comedies back in the day, there still is a twist at the end that makes this film truly unique. This is definitely a fun, feel-good type movie that still holds up today. Alright, some quick fun facts. As I mentioned earlier, there were two sequels without the King family that focused on the adventures of Mr. Belvedere. One was called Mr. Belvedere Goes to College from 1949, and then Mr. Belvedere Rings the Bell from 1951. I actually own the latter in which Belvedere livens up an old folks' home. I have yet to see the college one. Clifton Webb was actually nominated for Best Actor in the 1949 Academy Awards for playing Belvedere, but he lost to Laurence Olivier for playing Hamlet. Come on. In kind of a fun coincidence, John Payne was going to play Harry King before the role went to Robert Young. But Payne and O'Hara actually starred together the year prior in Miracle on 34th Street. All right, as was common for a lot of these older movies, and what I also like to try to do is add the radio adaptation if it's available. So, the Lux Radio Theater actually did an adaptation of Sitting Pretty on February 14th, 1949. So, let's tack that on at the end, and I will be back next week to discuss yet another random movie from my DVD collection. Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lieber Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Proudly presenting Photoplay Magazine's gold medal award picture, Sitting Pretty, starring Robert Young, Maureen O'Hara, and Clifton Webb. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. This is the big night of the season in the Lux Radio Theater, because tonight we present the picture that you, the moviegoers of America, have chosen as the one you liked best in 1948. It's that delightful comedy, Sitting Pretty, selected by you in a nationwide poll for Photoplay magazine. Our stars are Maureen O'Hara, Clifton Webb, and Robert Young, the original cast, which made the picture a hit for 20th Century Fox. After tonight's performance, Sitting Pretty will receive Photoplay Magazine's coveted gold medal award, one of Hollywood's highest honors. We had an idea some time ago that Sitting Pretty might win this award because every male has brought requests for it. These letters told us what you thought of Lux Flakes, too. And I'm sure that if we could take a poll of housewives, their gold medal award would go to Lux Flakes. Here's the curtain going up for Act One of Sitting Pretty, starring Clifton Webb as Lynn Belvedere, Robert Young as Harry, and Maureen O'Hara as Tacey. <laughs> Hummingbird Hill is a typical suburban community where everybody knows a little more than just a little about everybody else. For example, the neighbors all know that the Harry King's housekeeper simply up and quit today, leaving that nice Mrs. King with that big house, those three noisy children, and that terrible dog to take care of all by herself. Yes, the news went through the community like a flash, chiefly because of Clarence Appleton. Mr. Appleton lives on the corner and has very little to do except grow iris and mind other people's business. I am endeavoring to obtain some pollen from these iris. But why are you taking our flowers with a feather? I am not tickling, young man. I am gathering. I have your mother's permission, so just run along and don't bother me. We won't bother you. Just tell us what you're doing. Have you boys ever watched a bumblebee flitting from flower to flower? Sure. Well, I'm doing just what the bumblebee does. Wow. Can you sting, too? Oh, run away and play. No, no, wait, uh, just a minute. Uh, your housekeeper left today, didn't she? She sure did. You should have heard her, too. Indeed. Uh, tell me, what did she say? Hey, Larry, you can pull a pop Are you pop Are you pop Hold that 
this bicycle in the driveway. I guess I did, Pop. Sorry. How many times do I have to tell you kids never to do that? Did Somebody's like... Did you lose another case in court today? No, I didn't lose another case in court today. I guess it's the heat. And Mrs. Maypole quitting. Some housekeeper. She sure was a drip, Pop. Maybe you've got something there. Well, how are you, fellas? Oh, fine. What's wrong with Roddy? What's he crying for this time? Oh, he's just crying, Pop. You know, Roddy, he always has... Get off! Henry, get down! Oh, do something! Pull him off of me! Can't you kids train that big ox not to jump on people? He's just glad to see you, Pop. Some watchdog. He's glad to see everybody. Now, look here, Henry. I... Henry, leave that turtle alone! Henry, come back, Henry! Come on, hurry! We better get Henry! Oh. <sighs> Hello, honey. Bad day, huh? I'm sorry about Mrs. Maypole. Oh, Harry, she knew we had three children and a dog when she took the job. Now, don't worry, honey. You'll find somebody else. Say, isn't that Clarence Appleton in the garden? What the devil's he doing? Oh, that? Well, it seems that we have a very healthy male iris, and he asked if he could have some pollen so he could breed one of his own. You don't say. Well, at least we should get our choice of the litter. Oh, Harry, please. Now, about Mrs. Maypole. Well... I've decided that we just can't afford a regular housekeeper anyway, unless, of course, you got that raise. Well, no, not yet. But being invited to the boss's house for dinner is a hopeful sign. Who'd you get for a sitter tonight? I didn't, Harry. You didn't, but we're due there in an hour. Oh, I phoned at least 15 of the little darlings. They're all tied up, sitting. Oh, it's no use, Harry. Just phone Mr. Hammond and tell him that we can't come. Okay, Tacey. He'll probably fire me, but okay. Sometimes I wish he would fire you. The sooner you stop letting Mr. Hammond kick you around Look, my and... love, for the last time, there's more to starting a law practice than just hanging out a shingle. You have to make contacts, and the only way you can do that is with an old established outfit. You know I'm right, don't you? Well, I know you're a lot brighter than Mr. Hammond thinks you are. Thank you. Now, what are we going to do about a sitter? I mean for the future. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We are going to advertise. I'm going to put an ad in the paper for a, well, a, a resident sitter. What? A resident babysitter. Someone who can live in the spare room Oh, you're and... crazy. Oh, I knew you'd say that. But just you wait and see. There must be someone we can get. <laughs> Mrs. King? Uh, Mrs. Harry King? Yes. Good evening. I am Lynn Belvedere. You're... You're who? I'm the party who answered your ad in the paper. Lynn Belvedere. But... But you can't be. Why not? Have you ever seen me before? Oh, no, no. Uh, of course I haven't. Very well, then. Well, this is quite a shock. You see, we... Well, we advertised for a sitter and... Well, naturally thought we thought you were a woman. In your letter... Your advertisement, say... madam, of which I have a copy, makes no mention of sex. Oh, possibly not, but it was certainly implied. I need someone to help with the housework and sit with my children. Mrs. King, I happen to dislike all children intensely. <laughs> but I assure you that I can readily attend to their necessary, though unpleasant, wants. <sighs> Sorry. I've just had a long and very trying journey in the day coach. Uh, may I see my room? Your room? But, uh, but my husband isn't home yet. Uh, that, if I may say so, is a matter of complete indifference to me. <laughs> I take it you are not retaining my services to sit with him. But, but he's at the station. He, he's looking for you. I left the station 20 minutes ago. Well, he's expecting a woman. We, we just assume that you were a woman. You have made that painfully clear, Mrs. King. Now, may I please see my room? Why... Well, uh, I guess so. It, it's upstairs. Thank you. Hi, Mama. Boys, what are you doing still up? Now, go back to your room and go to sleep. Is he a babysitter? Gee whiz. Oh, um, uh, these are my sons, Mr. Belvedere. Larry and Tony, the uh, baby's asleep. Well, that's a blessing, isn't it? <laughs> Mom, why is it a man? <laughs> Uh, they, they seem to be quite fascinated by you, Mr. Belvedere. The fascination, I assure you, is not mutual. <laughs> oh, uh, this is the room, Mr. Belvedere. We, well, we tried to fix it up as nicely as we could. 
Of course, since you're a mister and not a miss, well, uh, one or two things are obviously a little out of place. Uh, flowers? Yes, I, I cut them myself this I'll afternoon. I'll just drop them here in the wastebasket. Uh, for my work, Mrs. King, I require an atmosphere of spot and simplicity. And may I ask what your profession is? Certainly. I am a genius. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, uh, well... Good night, Mr. Belvedere. Good night, Mrs. King. Harry! Harry, is that you? You and your cockeyed classified ass. You never even got off the train. Well, darling... <laughs> oh, darling, I've got something to tell you. <laughs> While you were what gone... So funny. <laughs> well, tell me. Uh, oh, I'm afraid to. You'll shock me. Oh, stop the comedy and tell me, Mrs. King. Oh. Um, uh, yes? Uh, before I retire, uh, may I inquire what time you serve breakfast? Hmm? Uh, I, um, uh, about 7.30. Uh, thank you. Perhaps I should tell you now. Uh, I like fruit juice, coffee, and thinly sliced gluten bread toasted. I'll, um... I'll try to remember. Uh, thank you. Good night. Who in the heck was that? <laughs> that, darling, is Lynn Belvedere. Huh? Tacy, it's a man! Harry, Harry, must you read your paper at the breakfast table? Huh? I always read paper at breakfast. Roddy, eat your cereal. Harry, please. What are we going to do about Mr. Belvedere? Very simple. As soon as he deigns to join us at breakfast, I'm going to kick him out. Right on his ear. Gee whiz, Cop. I think Mr. Belvedere's kind of cute. Me too. Besides, he says he's a genius. Well, I don't think he's cute. And genius or no genius, I'm going to see Mr. Belvedere right now. Oh, I'd better go up with you. Now, you boys stay right where you are and finish breakfast. Oh, uh, and help the baby with his cereal. Okay, Ma. Hiya, Roddy. How you doing with the cereal? Well, that I did to Roddy. He's grabbing a spoon, Larry. You better watch out. Oh, you wouldn't throw cereal at me, would you, Roddy? Why, that's baby stuff throwing cereal at me. <laughs> I warned you, Larry. I warned you. Roddy. Oh, gee whiz. Right in my hair. Mr. Belvedere, kindly open your door. Mr. Sound. Belvedere. Not a sound, Harry. He's probably still asleep. Well, we'll soon find out. Good morning. Oh, Harry, look. He's standing on his head. <laughs> Good morning. You you are standing on your head, aren't you? I am. Oh, oh, we're sorry to dash in on you like this, Mr. Belvedere, but we did knock. I don't doubt it, Mrs. King. When I practice my yoga, I'm completely out of this world. <laughs> I take it breakfast is ready. Now look here, you. When I talk to somebody, I want to look him in the eye, not in the foot. <laughs> well, say something. It's no use, dear. He's out of this world. He told you so. Come on, Harry. That's so silly. I never heard of such a thing. Standing on his head of all... <laughs> Here's your coffee, Mr. Belvedere. Thank you. The back. Oh, Roddy, no. Now put down that spoon. The back. Roddy, all over Mr. Belvedere's sleeve. Don't do that, little boy. <laughs> now, uh, look here, Belvedere. A joke is a joke, but this can't go on. Kindly be more precise, Mr. King. What can't go on? You're staying here, that's what. I'm perfectly willing to carry out my end of our agreement. I see no reason why you should default on yours. But it's impossible. You couldn't do the things we require. For example, could you... Could you bathe Roddy? Mrs. King, for many years I have successfully bathed individuals of all ages and sexes, and I've never had any complaints. <laughs> Little boy, don't do that again. That's enough, Roddy. Now stop it. Mr. Belvedere, my uh, wife tells me you're a genius. That is correct. Well, if I'm not too inquisitive, do you mind telling me what form it takes? Your genius? I am, in my way, a philosopher. Oh, I see. You, you just sit and uh, think. Mr. King, if more people just sat and thought, the world might not be in the stinking mess that it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you've got something there. And you can really handle children? <laughs> Hey, 
Henry, I believe you mentioned only three children. Uh, Henry's the dog. He's a great Dane. Probably the only great Dane in the country who'd rather chew my shirts than chew a bone. I dislike dogs intensely, Mr. King, almost as much as I dislike children. And your children, if I may say so, have peculiarly repulsive habits and manners. <laughs> However, I assure you I can cope with them successfully if given a free hand. <laughs> Gesundheit. Uh, Tony, Larry, sit down and finish your breakfast. Casey, I, uh... I'm going to the office. So long, kids. See you tonight. Bye, Dad. Oh, uh, yeah. Casey, would you mind walking to the car with me? Oh, uh, excuse me, Mr. Belvedere. Mm, and where do you boys think you're going? We're going to the car, too. You will remain seated. Huh? Sit down. Finish your breakfast and chew each mouthful 28 times. Why? Not 20, mind you, nor 26, but 28 times. As for your baby brother... <laughs> Casey, should we give the guy a whirl? Maybe for, no, for a day or two? Oh, I suppose so. At least the boys seem to like him. Roddy, what's happened to Roddy? Well, don't just stand there. He's been hurt. He's screaming. Larry, Tony, what happened to the baby? Roddy, look. Cereal. Roddy's got cereal all over his head. Yeah, bowl and all. Larry, if you told Roddy to dump his cereal on his head, I'll... didn't tell him anything, Pop. I was chewing my food. Yeah, me too. Twenty-eight times. Mr. King, as you can observe by the condition of my face and clothing, your youngest son has been pelting me with cereal ever since I sat down to this grisly meal. Huh? Therefore, I decided to teach the child an object lesson. You dumped cereal on his head? I did precisely that, Mrs. King, and you will note that he didn't like it. I guarantee that he will never throw cereal at me or anyone else again, ever. <laughs> Mr. Belvedere, consider yourself hired. He's done that to me, too. You know, you've got something. I couldn't agree with you more, Mr. King. You might even say I've uh, got everything. <laughs> Hiya, fellas. Hiya, Pop. Hey, look at us. Well, what goes with you two? We sat on our heads, Pop. Mr. Belvedere taught us. It's yoga. Oh, it feels swell. He says it relaxes you. Well, just be careful you don't relax so much you break your necks. We won't, Pop. Hi, baby. Everything under control? Hello, darling. Oh, Harry, he's terrific. He's got the kids out there standing on their heads. And they love him. They've been as good as gold all day. They what? He gave Roddy a bath, and there wasn't a peep out of him. Well, I'll be... Hey, the dog, what's the matter with Henry? Is he sick? No, darling. But he must be. Look, he just walked in and lay down. <laughs> Casey, that's the first time I've ever seen Henry walk. <laughs> Every other time, he's just galloped. He's not barking. No, darling. It seems that Mr. Belvedere used to be a dog trainer or something. Huh? And he had a long talk with Henry this morning. <laughs> Henry's been quiet as a mouse ever since. Isn't it wonderful? It's incredible. But there's just one thing, Henry, Harry. Mr. Belvedere, well, he's, he's sort of mysterious. How do you mean? Well, he locks himself in his room. I went up and listened, but I couldn't hear a sound. What do you suppose he does up there? He's so quiet. Well, maybe he stands on his head. That doesn't make much noise. Oh. <laughs> Is he up there now? Oh, no. He's out taking a walk. Then why are we whispering? Oh, I forgot. He says he's going to go out for a walk every night before dinner. Harry, do you suppose it would be very unethical if we went it up It most certainly and... would. But let's go. But I know it's the right key, Harry. Funny it doesn't work. Well, if it's the right key, it's got to work. Here, let me do it. You're wasting your oh. time, Mr. King. Oh. <laughs> uh, hello. Good evening. <laughs> Knowing human nature as I do, I suspected that you might try to snoop. This is a new lock on the door. But, but it can't be. I, I didn't order a locksmith. There was no occasion to, Mrs. King. I am an expert locksmith. <laughs> and now, if you'll excuse me, I will see you both later at dinner. <laughs> oh, oh uh, Harry, will you... Um... <laughs> Well, you'd better tell the boys to come in and wash. That won't be necessary, Mr. King. They're scrubbing their grimy little paws right now. 
I don't know, Tacey. He may be all right, but let's face it, he is a screwball. Well, a little eccentric, maybe, but... Are you father? Father? Since when am I father? Pardon me, sir, but I wish you'd see if Tony and I are good and clean. Are we father? Mr. Belvedere says that cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, dear, need I say more? I guess he stays, Tacey. <laughs> After a brief intermission, we'll present Act Two of Sitting Pretty. What is that book you were chuckling over, Libby? Oh, Chicken Every Sunday. Oh. 20th Century Fox has just made a movie of it, and the picture was so funny, I wanted to read the book and laugh all over again. I think Dan Daly is great as the dreamer looking for easy street. And Celeste Holm makes such a practical wife. She loved the chance to play such a natural role. Life in Mother's Boarding House provides plenty of human situations. I remember the scene in Chicken Every Sunday where uh, Celeste is washing dishes and Dan insists on taking over. <laughs> well, they had a good many retakes on that to get it just right. Celeste washed quite a pile of dishes, all told. And she was very pleased that the studio gave her Lux Flakes to do them. What could be more natural? Millions of women who care about their hands never use anything else for dishes. Lux Flakes are so mild and gentle, they don't redden or roughen hands as strong soaps often do. And yet it costs so little to use Lux Flakes for dishes three times a day, it's really easy on the budget. The tiny diamonds of Lux are so sheer, they practically melt into suds the instant water touches them. I've never seen such thick, rich suds. These tiny Lux diamonds are a real triumph of the world-famous Lever Laboratories. And the suds last so long, these wonderful diamonds actually go further. Ounce for ounce, they wash up to twice as many dishes as any of ten other leading soaps tested. They're thrifty. Here's our producer, William Keeling. Act two of Sitting Pretty, winner of Photoplay Magazine's Gold Medal Award. Starring Maureen O'Hara as Tacey, Clifton Webb as Lynn Belvedere, and Robert Young as Harry. <laughs> You just wouldn't recognize the King household anymore. Peace and serenity, like a halo, have settled over the little family. A blessing directly traceable to the gentleman in the spare bedroom, Mr. Lynn Belvedere. Now, on a wintry Sunday morning, Mr. Belvedere returns from a little visit downtown. Rounding the corner, he encounters the community gossip, Clarence Appleton. Why, it's Belvedere. Uh, good morning, Belvedere. You will kindly address me as Mr. Belvedere until I grant you permission to drop the title. A contingency which seems hardly likely, Mr. Appleton. Well, really, I, uh, I intended no offense. Uh, tell me, Mr. Belvedere, are you completely happy with the Harry Kings? Only an idiot is completely happy anywhere. <laughs> But uh, I understand those dear little boys are devoted to you, and that Mrs. King considers you quite the treasure. Indeed. Oh, uh, my dear mother is very anxious to make your acquaintance, Mr. Belvedere. Perhaps you could drop in on your next afternoon off? I am not a servant, Mr. Appleton. My afternoons are always my own. Oh. Well, in that case, drop in any time for a glass of sherry. I dislike sherry as much as I deplore the habit of dropping in on people uninvited. But, Mr. Belvedere, I am inviting you. And I, sir, am declining. Good day. <laughs> I don't know why we've got to be so particular, Tacey. I just thought we could surprise the kids with a snowman. If we're making a snowman, let's make it properly. Now, you finish the arms and leave the face to me. Okay, Mommy. We all know you were a great sculptress before I married you. Any face, even a snowman's, must have expression and character. Well, hurry up, or the kids will be home from Sunday school. Tacey, look. Uh, good morning, Mr. Belvedere. Good morning, good morning. Oh, I guess you left the house before we even got off. Yes, well, <laughs> cold enough for you? Mm, nippy, nippy, but it suits me. Well, how do you like our snowman? Mr. King, you should have let your wife do the face. I did the face. Oh, well, it will soon melt. <laughs> Casey, uh, what do you suppose he's got in that package? Oh, how do I know? I've given up wondering about anything he does or has. But it made a noise. I distinctly heard a sort of metallic ticking. So did I. If he's doing anything illegal up in that room, we could get into a lot of trouble. Harry, do you suppose if you climbed up on that tree and 
Well, maybe he crawled out on that limb. Me, you yeah, could... I could look right in his window. Tacey, go in the house. Well, why? Go in and watch the stairs. If he comes down, find some way to warn me. All right, but be careful. All I'm going to do is climb a tree. Can you see anything, Harry? Not yet, but I'm not high enough. Stop looking at me and watch for Mr. Belvedere. I am watching. I'll know what he's up to in just a minute now. Climbing trees, Mr. King, at your age. Huh? Oh, ah! ah, ah. Better come out, Mrs. King. Bring a roll of gauze, please, and some adhesive tape. Ow! Oh, take it easy, will you? That's my wrist. Kind to keep still. You're lucky that no bones are broken. I must say, that's a very professional bandage, Mr. Belvedere. There aren't many people who could do that. That's substantially what General Pershing told me during the First World War. You were a doctor, too? A bone specialist. Oh, no. Is there anything you haven't been? Yes, Mrs. King. I've never been an idler nor a parasite. Or have I ever climbed a tree to look into someone's bedroom? Now, Mr. King, how does your wrist feel? I guess I'll live. I hope it's better by tomorrow. I've got to go to Chicago. Indeed? Uh, Oh, I I thought I told you, Mr. Belvedere. Yes, he he has to go to Chicago on business. Mm, You'll have nothing to worry about, Mr. King. I shall endeavor to pinch hit for you at every available opportunity. (laughs) Well, thanks. That'll be just... Tacey, am I hearing things? Something squeaked. Why, why, yes, I heard it too, like like a bird. That's precisely what you heard, the twittering of a bird. The cage is in the living room, Mrs. King. Where on earth did it come from? That was my package, which you and Mr. King stared at so pointedly a little while ago. I'm opposed to the practice of exchanging gifts at any time, but since you were gracious enough to give me three pairs of excellent woolen socks on the occasion of my birthday, I try to get something for your anniversary that would give pleasure to your entire family. In brief... A canary bird. Oh, how very kind of you. Thank you, Mr. Belvedere. Oh, he's beautiful. Does he sing? Not yet, but uh, I shall teach him. <laughs> hey, Tacey, go out and tell Bill to lay off that horn, will you? But, darling, you've got to catch a train, and if Bill and Edna are driving you to the station, Nobody's better... driving me to the station. I've just decided I'm not going to Chicago. Well, why not? I can't go. I can't leave you here alone with Belvedere. Alone with... Are you out of your mind? Well, you seem to find him very attractive, Tacey. I find the Grand Canyon attractive, too, but that doesn't mean that I'm in love with it. You're mad about him. Oh, I am insane with passion. Now, look, Tacey, I, I'm not suggesting that you and Belvedere will carry on while I'm gone, but... Oh, that's darn white of you. But you know how gossip starts, and... Well, I just Look, would you feel any better if I slept at Edna's house while you're gone? Well, yes. Yes, I would, definitely. The kids won't like it. Well, I'll break it to them gently when they get home from school. You, uh, sure you don't mind? Certainly I'll mind. But every night I'll go over to Edna's and Bill's. Now pick up your bags, darling, and beat it. Do you want to get a kiss? No. I'm a one-man woman, and my heart belongs to Belvedere. Oh, for heaven's sake. I'm coming, Bill. So long, honey. Mm, You should be very gratified, Mrs. King. Oh, oh, Mr. Belvedere. If you'll permit the observation, I believe your husband was actually jealous in his sophomoric fashion. Mr. Belvedere, don't you consider eavesdropping a bit unethical? Unethical, but uh, fascinating. (laughs) I particularly enjoyed your comparing me to the Grand Canyon. (laughs) (laughs) Now, there's rugged grandeur. You'll pardon me, Mrs. King, it's... It's time I gave Roddy his bath. Larry! Larry, wake up! Larry! What's the matter, Tony? Larry, I'm sick. My stomach hurts. Go back to sleep and you'll feel better. I can. It hurts. Tell Mom. How can I tell Mom? You know she's sleeping on Aunt Edna. I want my mom. Will you pipe down, Tony? You'll wake Mr. Belvedere and Roddy. I don't care. Shh. Look, Tony, I know. Why don't you stand on your head the way Mr. Belvedere taught it? I already tried, but I only threw up. <laughs> okay. Okay, Tony. I'll wake Mr. Belvedere. But I'm warning you, he won't like it. Stop moaning, Tony. You requested your mother's presence, and I've already telephoned for her. She'll be here in a moment, and I... Larry, put that bottle down. Tony, 
said he wanted a drink, Mr. Belvedere. A drink of gin? Can't you read, young man? The label on that bottle clearly says distilled London dry gin. Oh, oh, that. It really isn't gin, Mr. Belvedere. The regular water bottle got smashed. It's just ice water. When your mother arrives, she can drown him in ice water as far as I'm concerned. Until then, put the bottle down. Oh, are you sure you call the right number, Mr. Belvedere? Kindly credit me with enough intelligence not to lose my head in a crisis. If I'm not mistaken, and I never am, there's a car turning down the corner right now. It's all right, Tony, darling, it's all right. There, now, back in bed and go to sleep. You'll be fine in the morning. Gosh, Mama, thanks for coming. Oh, did you take his temperature, Mr. Belvedere? No, I'm satisfied that he simply has a bellyache. <laughs> no more, no less. Oh, well, he feels nice and cool. I assure you, I could have handled this situation perfectly well myself, only the child expressed a maudlin desire for his mother. Well, I'm glad you did, Tony. Are you going to sleep here, Mom? No, dear. I'm going right back to Auntie Edna's. Oh, and by the way, Dopey, the next time you find a package of chewing gum, be sure it is chewing gum. Good night, darling. I'm sure he'll go right to sleep, Mr. Belvedere. Whereas I should be plagued with insomnia. I also hope you'll forgive my appearance. I don't usually rush through the streets in the middle of the night in a bathrobe and... Whoever could that be? If you go to the door, you need not conjecture. Oh. Mr. Appleton. Please, pardon the intrusion, Mrs. King, but I noticed all the lights go on, and knowing your husband is away, I felt constrained to dash over to see if anything was wrong. No, thank you, Mr. Appleton. Everything is fine. Oh, well, just a neighborly call, you might say, to offer my services if needed. <laughs> I can see that they're not. And how did you know our lights had gone on? Uh, did you borrow your mother's binoculars, or were you perhaps looking for pollen on your iris? Put, put down that bottle, Mr. Belvedere. I shall, Mr. Appleton. I merely intend to have a drink. Well, well, well I can see that I'm not needed here. Your vision is remarkably accurate evil-minded little worm. Mrs. King, do you know anyone who has a beehive? A good swarm of bees could ruin his iris. Mm, I know. But how could you get them to swarm? Oh, 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 now, don't tell me you were also a beekeeper. That is correct. <sighs> well, good night, Mrs. King. Good night, Mr. Belvedere. <laughs> Well, I simply had to tell you, Horatio, as Harry King's employer, as the man he works for, you simply well, must... Well, go on, be... Clarence. What else? Isn't that enough? There I was, calling on an errand of mercy, Belvedere in his pajamas, and Tacey King in... in... a negligee, cavorting about and guzzling gin. This is awful. The wife of my own employee. Well, I'm sending for Harry King at once. Oh, I, uh... I don't suppose you let this get around, Clarence. You haven't told anyone else. Well, uh, hardly anyone, Horatio. Drunk. Three o'clock in the morning. Miss Adams, take a telegram to Harry King. Now, if you'll just hold that pose, Mr. Belvedere... Oh, you're not getting bored, are you, Edna? Bored? I'm having a wonderful time. But I do have to run along. You may not have known it, Mr. Belvedere, but Tacey used to be quite a sculptress. Hmm, it's possible. And I think it's very sweet of you to pose like this and give her a chance to practice. My motives, Mrs. Philby, are not entirely unselfish. Someday they will need a bust of me in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> the only virtue you lack, Mr. Belvedere, is modesty. I do not consider that a virtue. Oh, I do. Harry is very modest. Your husband has a great deal to be modest about. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him get you down, sweetie. See you at the house tonight, huh? As usual, right after dinner. Goodbye, Mr. Belvedere. Uh, thank you for going. <laughs> now perhaps we can get something accomplished. I doubt it. It's your jaw, Mr. Belvedere. Your jaw, it, oh, it just isn't right. My jaw is perfect. Come here and I'll demonstrate. Now, if you, if you place your fingertips at the base of my jaw... Like, like this? A little higher. That's it. There we are. Now, feel how the orbicularis oris operates. Now, over here, at the jawbone. Well, can't you feel it? Oh, yes, yes. Well, well, this is a cozy little scene. Harry! Why, darling, what a wonderful surprise. 
I didn't expect you till Thursday. It's pretty obvious you didn't. Would you mind telling me just what you two were doing? I was permitting your wife to massage my larynx. And I might add, Mr. King, that your greeting to Mrs. King is scarcely cordial. I'll greet my wife any way I like. Harry. I came back from Chicago because Mr. Hammond sent for me. I just came from his office with my head so full of gossip that I don't know where... Gossip? I... What gossip? About you and Belvedere. Now, look here, Tacey. Stop raising your voice. I'll raise the roof if I want to. Tacey, look, I... Uh, I'm willing to believe that all these rumors about a drunken orgy with Belvedere are, are, are somewhat garbled, but... So I... that's it. The fine hand of Clarence Appleton. But my gosh, Tacey, just now when I came into the house, you were practically holding Belvedere in your arms. She was merely feeling my bone structure. You shut up and listen. <laughs> I am listening. All I can hear is a typical suburban husband reacting in a typically stupid and stuffy manner to a typical tempest in a teapot. He's right. And as for that drunken orgy, Tony got us all up in the middle of the night with a stomach ache. I dashed over from Edna's and I wasn't in the house ten minutes when that horrible little Mr. Appleton came snooping around. Oh, well, I uh, imagined it was something like that. <laughs> Look, um, I'll admit it's all pretty silly, but... Uh... Well, but what? Well, I was just thinking that perhaps it might be simpler all around if, if Mr. Belvedere sought employment elsewhere. I see. To satisfy malicious gossips like your dear boss and Clarence Appleton, you want us to... To kick Mr. Belvedere out. In a word, yes. And that is your final decision, Mr. King? Yes. I'm sorry, but that's final. No, Daddy, no! Oh, hi, kids. Please let him stay, please. Please, Father, I'll do anything you want, only please don't send Mr. Belvedere away. That's enough of that. Your father's not the type to be swayed by sentimental pleading. Don't let him go, Father, please. We love Mr. Belvedere. Don't go, Uncle Lynn. Little boy. Don't ever again, as long as you live, dare to call me uncle. <laughs> By no stretch of the imagination could I possibly be a relative of yours. My name is Mr. Belvedere. Is that clear? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's better. <coughs> what the heck's the matter with Roddy? Children are psychic, Mr. King. They can sense impending disaster. Okay, okay. I know when I'm licked. You can stay. Roddy, stop crying. And listen, the canary bird is singing. You, uh, sent for me, Mr. Hammond? Yes, Harry, I did. Sit down, Harry, sit down. Harry, how long is it since you returned from Chicago? Oh, about a month, Mr. Hammond. A month. Harry, the firm of Horatio J. Hammond and Associates has a spotless name in this community. Absolutely spotless. Yes, I'm sure it has. And as I told you about a month ago, I consider it mandatory for all connected with this firm and their wives never to incur the slightest gossip of a scandalous nature. Oh, now, wait a minute. If you're still harping about those stupid rumors... I that... do not harp. Harry, where was your wife last night? Now, look here, Mr. Hammond. This has gone far enough. I agree with you. Last night, your wife and Mr. Belvedere were seen together at the Crystal Cafe. They were dancing the Roomba. That's ridiculous. Last night, Tacey and Edna Philby attended a lecture at the women's club. You were with your wife? No, I wasn't. I, I was tired and I went to bed early. I don't doubt that Tacey might have attended the lecture. But I know that after the lecture, she was dancing the Roomba with Mr. Belvedere at the Crystal Cafe. I saw them there myself. So did my wife, Mrs. Hammond. So did Clarence Appleton and his mother. Now for the details. Oh... It hurts me, Harry. It hurts me deeply to tell you this. Harry, we're in the kitchen, darling. Mr. Belvedere is make them, making the most delicious salad. I'm glad he's here. What I've got to say is for both of you. Tacey, why didn't you tell me you were out dancing with this man last night? Now, what have you heard? Answer my question. Why didn't you tell me? Well, I tried to tell you when I got home, but you were so sleepy and disagreeable you wouldn't listen. Then, then, then why didn't you tell me this morning at breakfast? I can be sleepy and disagreeable, too. Mr. King, our meeting last night was purely coincidental, but uh, most enjoyable. Then you admit it! Certainly. Moreover, he rumbles like a saint. I don't care if he dances like Arthur Murray. You may be interested to know, Mr. King, I taught Arthur Murray. Now, look, Tacey, your conduct is making me the laughing stock of Hummingbird Hill. Why, Mr. Hammond said, stop shredding that lettuce. Life must go on, Mr. King. Well, it's not going on with you in this house. 
Harry, I think you'd better pull yourself together. After the lecture last night, Edna and I went to the Crystal Cafe for a cup of coffee. It just happened that Mr. Belvedere was there. Go on, Tacey. He was kind enough to dance with me. Then we each had a cocktail. We went Dutch, Mr. King. I have neither the means nor the presumption to buy cocktails for other men's wives. So suppose you apologize to both of us now for this Apologize? Absurd... I should apologize because of your indiscretions? Very well, Harry. Until you come to your senses and stop letting Mr. Hammond run our lives, I'm going to take Roddy and go home to Mother. Go right ahead. It's perfectly all right with me. Oh, Harry. It would be difficult to tell which of you is behaving more foolishly, but uh, I think you have a slight edge, Mr. King. You keep out of this. <laughs> well, I thought you were going home to Mother. Very well, if that's the way you feel about it. Satisfied, Mr. Belvedere? You've just smashed my home. Stupidity never gives me satisfaction, Mr. King. Your wife is right. You owe her an abject apology. I've half a mind to punch you right on the nose. It takes half a mind to resort to such measures. Why, you, you... Oh, my hand, my hand. I believe you've slid at the door, Mr. King. I neglected to tell you that in my youth, I was quite expert in the art of fisticuffs. Get out of here! Yes, Mr. King, yes. I think perhaps it's time I left. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Before we bring you Act Three of Sitting Pretty, I'd like to have you meet our special guest, Helen Westcott, an ambitious young player who spends her free time, as well as her working hours, on the 20th Century Fox lot. How about that, Helen? I just can't keep away, Mr. Keeley. I get a real thrill out of watching the stars work. Then, if you saw A Letter to Three Wives being filmed, you had a chance to watch three stars at once. Yes, I did. Linda Darnell is wonderful, the perfect glamour girl. And I think Ann Southern is absolutely right for a smart, successful career wife. Jean Crane has the most sympathetic role, perhaps, as a young wife who doesn't know how to live up to the country club crowd. It was exciting watching those big country club dad scenes in A Letter to Three Wives. But they worked on them so long, I felt sorry for Jean. <laughs> she said her nylon stood up better than she did under the strain of so much dancing. I'm sure Lux Flakes had something to do with that, Helen. Oh, you're right, Mr. Kennedy. The wardrobe girl told me it's a rule of the studio always to use Lux Flakes for stockings, just as they do for everything washable. These tiny diamonds of Lux are a real economy. Scores of strain tests on all kinds of stockings prove it. Washing stockings with strong soap or rubbing with cake soap make runs come quickly. But with Lux Flakes, even sheer nylons last twice as long. I do believe that's true, Mr. Kennedy. I'm devoted to Lux Flakes myself. Well, then you've probably noticed how much faster these tiny diamonds of Lux dissolve. They bubble up into suds the instant water touches them. Make richer suds, too, that last and last. They're such perfect care for stockings, it's no wonder 90% of the makers of stockings recommend these tiny diamonds of Lux. Thank you for coming tonight, Helen Westcott. Thank you. Back now to our producer, William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of Sitting Pretty. The Photoplay Magazine Gold Medal Award winner, starring Clifton Webb as Lynn Belvedere, Robert Young as Harry, and Maureen O'Hara as Tacey. <laughs> For ten days now, Hummingbird Hill has had plenty to talk about. Tacey has taken the baby and rushed off to her mother's. Mr. Belvedere has mysteriously disappeared. And Harry is struggling unhappily to keep together what remains of his home. But now, something akin to an atom bomb has suddenly struck the community. A new novel has appeared in all the bookstores, and the critics are raving about it. Unknown author writes brilliant satire of life in the suburbs. Sensational new novel hailed as best in years. First and second printing sold out entire country clamoring for copies. And what has this new book to do with Hummingbird Hill? Plenty. It's all about Hummingbird Hill and the people who live there. And the author, of course, 
is none other than Lynn Belvedere. For certain readers, the novel holds a particular and dismaying interest. People like Clarence Appleton. Mother, Mother, have you read the second chapter? It's all about me and about you, too. Do you see what he calls us? He calls... Mother, Mother, speak to me. It's Clarence. It's your boy, Clarence. Mother, Mother! And then there are others, like Horatio J. Hammond. It's slander, that's what it is. Get Harry King in here right away. Bring me every book we have on libel laws. Why, I'll sue to the highest court in the country. The whole town will sue. He's made fools of every one of us. Yes, Lynn Belvedere has used Hummingbird Hill as the background for a wonderfully witty book. And Hummingbird Hill is speedy. Well, except a few residents, such as Edna Philby and her husband, Bill. How is she coming to the phone? Well, what is the up? What's the matter? Can't they find Casey? Oh, Casey. Hello, Casey? Hello? Hello. Oh, Casey, how are things at home? Oh, you have to Oh, 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 Harry's just been fired. But why? For harboring Belvedere under his roof. Hey, tell her about me. Oh, yeah, yeah. And when Bill tried to stand up for Harry, old man Hammond fired Bill, too. Oh, my gosh. And you know what they're going to do this afternoon? Some movie company's going to make a newsreel right at your house. A newsreel? Uh Uh-huh. They're bringing Belvedere back to get some intimate shots of the master at the scene of his triumph. Edna, put Harry on the phone. I've just got to speak to Harry. Well, I'm sorry, Tacey, but... uh, we don't know where Harry is. But what's happened to him? Oh, probably nothing. He's probably just out somewhere looking for a nice, soft shoulder to cry on. Bill says that he... Tacey! Hello! Well, the part about the nice, soft shoulder must have worked, Bill. Ten to one, Tacey takes the first plane home. <laughs> What's the matter with you policemen? We're trying to make a newsreel in this house. Can't you keep that mob quiet out there? We're doing our best, Mr. Billingsley. There must be 2,000 people out here. Half of them want his autograph and half of them want to kill him. Exactly the type of reaction I anticipated. Well, I, I guess we're ready to shoot, Mr. Belvedere. Now, I'll be behind the camera, and I'm going to ask you a few questions. So just be perfectly relaxed, and I'll... Young man, I need no instructions. I have directed many pictures. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. All right, boys. Quiet. Quiet. Quiet, please. Roll them. Now, Mr. Belvedere, tell us. How did you write this book? I wrote it with a quill. Oh, that's... That's very important. Who is that? Well, what's that? I live here. I, I guess I can go into my own house. I don't know, lady. Hey, Chief, she says she lives here. Let her in, then. Oh, you're Mrs. King, eh? I most certainly am, and if you try to stop me, I'll sue the police department. You might as well, me. lady. Everybody else in town has got a lawsuit. Let her through, Al. Oh, it's Mom! Tony, look! Larry, Tony! Oh, you darlings. Oh, I've missed you so much. Where's Daddy, Mom? Oh, I left him with Auntie Edna. Oh, it's so good to see you. Where's Daddy? He's inside, Mom. They're letting him watch the movie. Well, we're going to watch, too. Come on. Huh? Mr. Belvedere, critics throughout the country have unanimously hailed your novel as a masterpiece of sheer genius. That is correct. Well, uh, <laughs> how do you feel about it? I feel they were quite conservative. Hey, Quiet over there. We're trying... Cut, cut. That must be Mrs. King. It certainly is. Oh, Tacey. Gosh, I'm glad to see you. Oh, I had to come back, darling. I came the minute I heard you were in trouble. Don't worry. It'll all work out all right. I... I've been such a dope, Tacey. You have indeed. But there's no need to be emotional, Mrs. King. He won't starve. Oh, Mr. Belvedere, I don't quite know whether to congratulate you or to... to... Strike me with a baseball bat. (laughs) Well, yes. It's a moot point. Mr. Belvedere, please, we haven't finished shooting. You are mistaken, young man. We have. Now, run along and take your little helpers with you. Edna, is that you? Oh, 
Well, come on in. Ronnie wants his mama, Tacey. I'm sorry, but I thought I'd better bring him over. Come on upstairs, Edna. Let's get out of this shambles. Yeah, go ahead, dear. I'll be up as soon as I get rid of this gang. Look, fellas, enough's enough. Get all these people and cameras out of here, will you? Okay, boys, wrap it up. Just one of the penalties of fame, Mr. King. Well, I'm not famous. You will be. My book has made you immortal. Hey, you, you can't call him that. I am Horatio J. Hammond, and I'll go anywhere I please. Where is this Belvedere person? Oh, oh, there you are. Don't you take your hat off when you crash somebody's house. Don't you talk to me like I'll that. I'll talk to you any way I like. You fired me, remember? Take off your hat. All right, it's off. Now then, Mr. Belvedere, it gives me the greatest possible pleasure to serve you personally with this summons. Summons? Well, well, how interesting. I am suing you for one million dollars for libel. Splendid. That's a good round sum. I'm going to sue you too. And me. And I, Mr. Taylor. My mother and I are going to sue for another million dollars. In addition, we shall see that you are run out of town. Excellent, Mr. Appleton. Such a notoriety will cause the sale of my book to soar even higher, if that is possible. Mr. King, Mr. Philby, would you two young men be interested in acting as my attorneys in these threatened suits? Are you serious? Mr. King, I never jest about a million dollars. Money is the root of all evil, and I have the greatest possible respect for it. <laughs> okay, Mr. Belvedere, we'll be very happy to defend you. I'll say we will. The law firm of Philby and King will be open tomorrow morning. And they'll have their work cut out for them because we intend to sue not only you, but everybody who supplied you with this libelous information. Excellent idea, Mr. Hammond. You should always go to the source. I intend to. Has it occurred to any of you gentlemen who that source might be? Who is the person who knows all about everyone in Hummingbird Hill? Who is the one that for years has made a repulsive habit of snooping and gossiping about his neighbors? Who is it among us, for example, who knows all our little peccadilloes with girls in florist shops? The girl was merely delivering flowers to that motel. And they were not orange blossoms, Mr. Taylor, were they? And you, Mr. McPherson? Why, you have caricatured me in this book as a drinking man. It is not I who counts the empty bottles in your trash can, Mr. McPherson. Just one little moment. Are you insinuating that I... I let the chips fall where they may, Mr. Appleton. But I am not... And, Mr. What? Hammond, who is it that takes a habit of reading his neighbor's mail? Their you mail. Oh, this is outrageous. Are you suggesting that I have been your, your collaborator? Don't be so presumptuous. Let me put it in terms that even you will understand. You, Mr. Appleton, have spread the pollen. I have reaped the harvest. But, but I... But this is fantastic. I have been more grossly maligned in this book than, than anyone. It is only poetic justice that a stool pigeon should be roasted. So? So you were the one, Appleton. No, no, Horatio, let us not be hasty now. Why, Horatio, you little no, weak. No, no, Horatio, no. Let me alone. Mother, mother, help. Mama! More toast, Harry? Coffee? Thanks, Daisy. Hey, take a look at this. They've got Clarence Appleton's picture in the paper. <laughs> Boy, what a shiner. <laughs> I bet it nearly killed him when Mr. Hammond went over and trampled down his iris bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, how would you like to go celebrating tonight? Hmm, love to. Would you care to take me dancing? Dancing? Remember, I uh, don't dance as well as Mr. Belvedere. No, dear, but you're much prettier. Uh-oh, wait a minute. We can't go anywhere. Who'll sit with the kids? I will. Mr. Belvedere. The mere fact that I have been catapulted into fame does not blind me to the obligation I undertook here. Mr. Belvedere, you're an amazing man. Just what are your plans for the future? My dear Mrs. King, this book of mine is only the first volume of a trilogy. I estimate the other two volumes will take me at least two years more. And you, uh, you're going to write them here? Posterity will demand that the entire masterpiece be written under the same roof. Your house will become a shrine, Mr. King. I'm surprised that you even want to stay. It can't be very convenient. You claim you don't even like children. Uh, that is correct. Now, if you'll excuse me. Oh, uh, Mr. Belvedere. Yes? I think it's only fair to tell you that before long we're, uh, well, we're expecting another child. Then you'll find me of great service, Mrs. King. <laughs> I was also an obstetrician. <laughs> Our 
our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. All aboard for London, Paris, Cairo, Honolulu. But hurry, it's the chance of a lifetime. Don't miss the boat in Lever's sensational $50,000 travel contest. You may win the most wonderful vacation you'll ever have in your life. Just imagine. First prize is a round-the-world tour for two. All travel expenses paid, plus $1,000 pocket money and $700 for new clothes. Or you can have $10,000 in cash. And that's not all. Fifteen wonderful second prizes, too. Each an all-travel expense trip to Europe. Or $2,500 in cash. Besides all that, there are 400 additional cash prizes, each a crisp new $10 bill. If you win the first prize, you travel in luxury for 101 days. The best accommodations everywhere. All trips are arranged by Thomas Cook and Son, world-famous travel agents. Get in on this exciting contest tonight. Here's all you do. Just finish this statement in 25 words or less. I like the large size box of Lux Flakes because... Send each entry with a box top from the large size Lux Flakes to Lever Tour the World Contest, Box 1, New York 8, New York. Follow complete rules on the entry blank you can get at your store. Get your entry in this week, sure. This is our last announcement on the Lux Radio Theater. Mail entry to Lever Tour the World Contest, Box 1, New York 8, New York. Only residents of continental United States, Alaska, and Hawaii are eligible. We return you now to William Keeley. We know now why Sitting Pretty was picked as the favorite film of the year. And here are three of the reasons. Robert Young, Maureen O'Hara, and Clifton West. Bill, we'd all like to tell the audience how pleased we are by the selection of Sitting Pretty. And I think Clifton Webb deserves a special credit for his portrayal of Mr. Belvedere, which has won him a nomination for the Academy Award. Thank you, Bob. And now, of course, 20th Century Fox has starred Clifton in a sequel to Sitting Pretty. The new film is Mr. Belvedere Goes to College. Imagine me in college, the all-American tackle of 1949. <laughs> I'll probably wind up in the Rose Bowl. Uh, playing tackle? No, picking roses. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll all be picking up medals later tonight when Sitting Pretty receives Photoplay Magazine's Gold Medal Award at the gala dinner at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I understand George Jessel will be the master of ceremonies. That's right, Bob. And our audience can get complete details of all the awards in the March issue of Photoplay Magazine, which is out now. I was very pleased to learn that The Street With No Name has been selected as one of the ten most popular pictures of the year. Oh, Bill, before we leave for the dinner, I'd like to pass on a personal award of my own to Lux Flakes. We always have it on hand at my home. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> and now for next week's play. It's a current success from Universal International Studios, The Unafraid. And we'll have the original stars of the picture, Joan Fontaine and Burt Lancaster. This is a hard-hitting action drama that brings together, for the first time, a new romantic team, the lovely and accomplished actress Joan Fontaine and the two-fisted Burt Lancaster. You'll have another hit in your hands, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'll see you all later at the Photoplay Awards dinner. Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Fontaine and Burt Lancaster in The Unafraid. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Maureen O'Hara appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of Down to the Sea in Ships, starring Richard Widmark and Lionel Barrymore. Heard in tonight's cast were Gail Gordon as Appleton, Ed Begley as Hammond, 
Francis Robinson as Edna, and Donald Randolph, Johnny McGovern, Jeffrey Silver, Eddie Marr, Bill Johnstone, Ken Christie, Bob Griffin, Cliff Clark, George Neese, Leon Ledoux, and David Light. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silver. This program has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the safe, gentle care recommended 33 to 1 by makers of nice washables. We appreciate your many friendly letters telling us of your own experience with our product, and we value your comments and suggestions on plays you'd like to hear. Be sure to join our coast-to-coast listening audience every week for the best in dramatic entertainment on the Lux Radio Theater. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The Unafraid, starring Joan Fontaine and Burt Lancaster. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hey, this is Brian Davis, and you might know me from the Damn Good Movie Memories podcast. And now, get ready for the Bad Beat Show on ThatMetalStation.com from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern every Wednesday night. I'm going to play some kick-ass hard rock inspired by the blues, because after all, the foundation of all things rock and metal is, of course, the blues. So join me every Wednesday night for the Bad Beat, because even when you lose, you still win. We are officially on Spotify now, so if you don't use iTunes, if you don't use the Podbean app, you can go to Spotify and get all of our past episodes. You can stream it on there, so if you're a Spotify user, you can go find Damn Good Movie me- <laughs> I can't even say my own podcast. Damn Good Movie Memories. Yes, I know what I'm talking about. I'm the host, right? Okay, so go to Spotify, look for Damn Good Movie Memories. You can stream all of that stuff. And yeah, so if you don't want to use iTunes, you don't want to use Podbean, you can use Spotify as well. All right, before we sign off, we do have T-shirts are available for sale. All you have to do is go to TeePublic, that's T-E-E-P-U-B-L-I-C dot com, and you can get your very own Damn Good Movie Memories T-shirt. You can get all sizes, any gender. You can get whatever you want just at the tip of your fingers. So just go to TeePublic.com, look up Damn Good Movie Memories, and you can get your very own T-shirt. If you enjoy this podcast and are an iTunes user, please do the show a favor and head on over to the official iTunes page for Damn Good Movie Memories. Be sure to leave a rating and a review. This will allow the show to appear higher in the algorithm and spread the joy of this podcast to the masses. If you are not an iTunes user, you can still listen and subscribe on Podbean at damngoodmoviememories.podbean.com. Be sure to like us on Facebook under our Damn Good Movie Memories page. You can also listen to a limited number of episodes on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and be sure to tune in next week for an all new episode of Damn Good Movie Memories. I am Dr. Fuck. And I'm the actual alcoholic. And we are part of the Rock and Metal Combat Podcast. We are the Rock and Metal Combat Podcast. That's right. And the way you can check us out is we are on iTunes and also Podbean. And we forgot a review recently. I got this review right here. It says right here, it says, Rock and Metal Combat Podcast is the greatest podcast in the world. And it's my number one podcast signed by Science. Now, and then Science also says... Science! Science also said... My second favorite podcast is It Doesn't Matter, The Rest Suck. Rock and Metal Combat Podcast on iTunes and Poppy. Check it out. Science! Are you ready for the hottest new podcast out there? Check out the Vieira Vault featuring none other than Dr. Fuck Ralph Vieira. You will hear personal stories and personal songs from the vault. There ain't nothing else like it. The one, the only, the original, Vieira Vault. On Podbean, Stitcher.com, and iTunes. Spreaker.
God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is Stephen Michael from the Growing Up Rock Podcast. If you're like me and my co-host, Sonny Hollywood Pooney, you grew up loving hard rock and metal music. Check out our podcast where we talk to bands and artists that help create the soundtrack to our lives, along with playing some killer new and old deep tracks of kick-ass guitar-driven rock and roll. Find us wherever you find your podcast to listen to, that's the Growing Up Rock Podcast, G-R-O-W-I-N-U-P-R-O-C-K. And feel free to hit us up at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Growing Up Rock. So sit back and crank it up. <laughs> 